When COVID-19 brought the world to a halt, it gave the planet an unprecedented ability to breathe, which raises a critical question. If leaders across the world could take bold action against this global threat, why haven't we seen this on the environmental front? The UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change convened this session to explore ways to turn the current urgency into decisive action on behalf of the planet. Hello everyone, my name is Sophia Kiani and I am an 18-year-old Iranian-American climate activist. And so today I'm going to be moderating this session, which I designed with the help of the members of the Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. So the Secretary General established this Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change to advise him and offer a youth perspective on his efforts to accelerate global action on climate change. So the group will also be helping advancing the Secretary General's six climate positive actions, what, which he is urging governments to consider as they build back their economies, societies, and communities. So these climate positive actions are one, to invest in green jobs, two, to not bail out polluting industries, three, to end fossil fuel subsidies, four, to take climate risks into account in all financial and policy decisions, five, to work together, and six, to leave no one behind. So the theme for this session today is going to be moving forward with a new normal, working together for climate action. And so the Youth Advisory Group came together to choose this theme because we believe that everyone has a role to play in advancing climate action, recovering from COVID, and building a new normal. And so today, uh, being mindful of that theme, we have chosen four additional speakers. Um, and so first, we have Genevieve Jiva, who is a young climate leader from Fiji, and she's going to be offering us a youth perspective on how youth can uh, play a part in combating the climate crisis. Then we have uh, Joanna Wapichina, who belongs to the Wapichana Indigenous People, and she was elected the federal deputy for Romera, her home state, and she was the first Indigenous federal parliamentarian in Brazil. So she's going to be offering us um, an Indigenous perspective on what role Indigenous people play in uh, helping to combat the climate crisis. And then next, uh, really offering a perspective of how celebrities and influencers can play a part. We have Alex Rendell, who is an actor in the United Nations Environmental Programs, National Goodwill Ambassador for Thailand. And then lastly, offering how the UN and government officials and policymakers can play a part. We have Assistant Secretary General Salman Hart, who leads the Secretary General's Climate Action Team and ensures the delivery of the Secretary General's climate change priorities. And so thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to start off the session by uh, first directing a question at Genevieve Jiva. So it is pretty clear that the status quo isn't working and we need to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, but we can't go back to the new normal. So where, where, where should we be going? And in your view, what does the new normal look like? Thank you, Sophia. Um, and good morning, good evening. Uh, to everyone wherever you are. For me, this question really comes down to um, inequality and people. The COVID-19 global pandemic, like the climate crisis, really knows no borders and is exacerbating inequalities from a broken economic system in which profit is tantamount. It accumulates in a few hands and the majority are left struggling to achieve a decent quality of life. And so we need leaders all around the world and especially developed countries and major polluters to ramp up actions, move away from fossil fuels and enable a safe and just transition to renewable energy. Our leaders must take strong, decisive, ambitious and transformational actions to address the climate crisis, ensuring outcomes that are time bound, measurable and reflect the severity of the human rights economic and livelihood consequences of the climate crisis for the people of the Pacific and for those all around the world. And the world cannot return to business as usual. We must work towards a just recovery that is people-centered, context-sensitive, and truly leaves no one behind. And this means that we must put people first in our responses, provide support to communities in building resilience and solidarity, and change our systems to comprehensively respond to impacts faced by vulnerable and marginalized groups. The new normal must focus on a sustainable future for all. Thank you. 
course, that was such an insightful answer. And so as a young person, I would love to know what role do you think young people should play in shaping this new normal? So like, how can we harness our energy to advance tangible actions and ensure our participation in relevant policy processes? Thank you, Sophia. I think young people around the world are already saying enough is enough and showing that systems must change. In the Pacific in particular, where I work and live um, and hope to continue living and having a future, young leaders are pivoting, um, are finding new ways to organize, organizing online where possible to continue sharing their stories and lived realities in this fight. And we know that the Pacific story is not just one of impacts, it's also of resilience. It's of fighting, it's of standing in solidarity with others. And this week, uh, I've been part of the Pacific Climate Warriors Matangi Malohi Week of Action. And in my country, 350 Fiji has organized Kalanoa's artivism and community gardening activities. The Pacific Island students fighting climate change continue to advocate for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. These young mm -hmm. leaders are among so many that are leading, advocating, creating, and fighting. We know that young leaders must play a pivotal role in shaping this new normal because more and more of them will be transitioning into leadership at a critical time in the climate crisis. We will be living with the consequences and there must be nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thank you. I 100% agree and resonate with what you're saying. Um, and so thank you for that. And now I'm going to be asking uh, Joenia to join us in this conversation, uh, specifically talking about Indigenous communities. So Indigenous communities are among the most affected by the climate crisis. And we've seen massive fires in the Amazon over the last few years and an unrestrained increase in environmental degradation. We know that Indigenous leaders and communities are already protecting nature and promoting solutions to face this global challenge. And so can you tell us more about how they are helping to promote climate action and how can the youth get involved in these decision-making processes or influence policies? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the invitation and compliment the organization of this event, uh, which I consider important to everybody to promote the intergeneration dialogue. Uh, second, I, I wanted to affirm that we Indigenous people deeply regrets the President Bolsonaro's speech yesterday in the UN General Assembly. Uh, he is not recognizing and assuming his responsibility as the leader of uh, the country, leader of Brazil, uh, and his obligation to protect the environment and addition to deny the technical data, data on the fire and deforestation, especially when the Pantanal and Amazonia biomes burn with fire. In addition, um, to deny uh, and not uh, uh, point out a solution, blaming indigenous peoples and traditional community for their irresponsibility. Uh, furthermore, I uh, emphasize that indigenous people had been security to the 19th thing, this, this situation of the countless setbacks and dismantling of environmental and indigenous policies uh, to resist the renewal of racism and anti-indigenous and anti-environmental policy. On the other, other hand, in the relation to the youth rising, I wanted to say that there are several activities that had been happening for some time when the people began to feel uh, that the forest was drying up, uh, that it was shine, changing, uh, that happened in this section and all biomes. Uh, even before feeling the effect of climate change, indigenous uh, political leaders uh, like shamans, like Davi Kopenawa, Yanomami, clearly realized that the highly consumist uh, Western way of the lie was destroying the planet. Representative organization like the indigenous cons of Horaima began in partnership to 
document the effect of climate change that are occurring to think about uh, now to mitigate and uh, mm -hmm. how to mitigate the effects of this climate change, how can I have one food, uh, food security, uh, how not to lose the seeds, uh, on the uh, technology of the use, they each type of the soil and the maintain of the water source and truth start the elaboration of the plan to confront the climate change uh, according to indigenous worldview and the experience of the good practice, traditional technology and this is to the sustainability vision, uh, especially the use of the natural resource and the form of the social organization to be considered and the shared, shared responsibility of the community, including young people and the women, and the process to, to uh, make decision uh, and make it change. Um, and there is a whole challenge on how to involve young people so that they receive the technology that is passed on orality way. Uh, for example, the Yanomami uh, had a meeting of shamans, which included the presence of indigenous uh, young peoples was observed uh, for young people to see then action as uh, apprentice. Uh, the federal uh, indigenous organization of the Rio Negro for uh, developed a training program for young communication uh, where they use new technology to resist uh, resist and uh, disseminate technology. The young in Horaima uh, are involved in expression activity of indigenous land. So uh, they are not invaded in degraded, uh, but there is a, a need for continuous support for this initiative. This is passed. I, I, we have received uh, the ambassador from the US and he said he was concerned about the fact the indigenous people always need support and, and they, uh, that they should have financial autonomy. But in fact, the indigenous people were not yet sufficiently recognized and rewarded for the, all the social and environmental service they provide to the planet. So there is still more recognition and retribution for the maintain of forests, water, springs, for having a spiritual connection that the materialistic world was lost. And all this is values for indigenous people that should be encouraged in young people. So they participate in this process strongly in the ethnic identity and they can uh, contribute to this dialogue between indigenous uh, people and non-indigenous, uh, but uh, in it is strong. So uh, uh, I could give a lot of example in this school to our red training more than 100 indigenous in my state, but many of them did not yet obtain support to work in the Hidei community. My sustainability network party encouraged the participation of indigenous in these policies. I participated last week in the electoral convention in my state uh, and we are going to launch several young candidates for cons consulars and the municipality. Uh, it's also another way to encourage young people to participate in public life and to, contrib to contribute to the decision making uh, that respect the rights of the indigenous peoples. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I mean, as the first Indigenous woman deputy of Brazil, you were an inspiration. It was so wonderful hearing from you. And now being mindful of time, I'll move to Alex Rendell. Uh, we're so excited to hear from you. And so I would love to first ask you, can you tell us a little bit more about your current efforts as the UN Environment Program's National Goodwill Ambassador for Thailand to advance climate action and any challenges you've overcome in pursuing this work? 
I thank you, Sophia, and Bodhikrap to everyone out there from Thailand. Uh, so at the at UNEP or the United Nations Environmental Program, we are currently running for what we call the triple planetary crisis, which goes for um, climate change, loss of biodiversity, and also uh, pollution. So my job pretty much is to uh, act as a voice to to use my social media platforms or to, to, to appear at certain events in order to shape the way that uh, society thinks and the way and the understanding that they have towards uh, the, the, the bad trio we are trying to attack. So um, I also work a lot with young children. I have an organization myself that does an education camp. So we do a lot of topics on, on climate change, on pollution. And uh, one of the biggest challenges I'm facing right now is because of this pandemic, we are, uh, it's very difficult to get like big gatherings and my job really involves around uh, being with lots of people. So I'm doing a lot of online work and I'm doing a lot of Zoom talks and speaking in groups with a lot of different uh, people from around the country. So yeah, so my job pretty much is just to, to educate everyone and have a greater understanding of the problem because um, I, I personally believe that education is the way out to most of the, the, the crisis that we are going through or, or, or any environmental crisis. Yeah, I definitely agree. And so with your position, you know, as a high profile individual, how do you think other high profile individuals with global followings can best connect with and support local struggles to advance climate action and sustainable development? Well, to be completely honest, from my experience with working with a lot of other actors, um, I could I could say that not many are quite aware of how much influence they have towards society, like their post or whatever they write or wherever they appear, their reaches. It's amazing. It's more than the journalists themselves, you know, so whatever they say or whatever they write they're they're pretty much shaping the mindsets of society. And and and, and an example of that will be like climate change if in Thailand here. Uh, if you were to translate it into Thai and translate it back into English again, it means change in weather. It doesn't really define the, the problem of climate change. So it's very difficult to, to, to solve a problem if the general public aren't really aware or don't really understand or can't really digest the definition. So I think that high profile celebrities or influencers really have the responsibility to be able to make that change and have that better understanding for society and 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 have movements going on and attract uh, or act as a bridge for for governments for private and public sectors for different campaigns and different laws legislations to be to be changed so they are responsible and they can really have an influence especially towards young people to to, to shape the next generation of leaders to make uh decisions that will affect everyone because I think that public participation is the most important thing. It's very difficult for someone to be able to solve a problem on their own. You need stakeholders from all different sectors to come together and, and really make a change. Absolutely. I mean, I actually work in translating climate information, so that was really insightful to hear about the difficulty in translation. Um, and so now we're going to move on to Assistant Secretary General Selwyn Hart, who's going to be giving us a um, perspective on what the UN and other government and policymakers can be doing to help combat the climate crisis. And so, Selwyn, from your experience, what is the most effective way of building broad and lasting coalitions for climate action? And how is the United Nations working to ensure inclusivity in its approach to addressing the climate crisis? Thank you so much, Sophia. And I just want to congratulate you and the other members of the Youth Advisory Group and the other members of this panel really for um, for putting on this discussion and base, you know, strong leaders and advocates for the most ambitious climate action. We need your voices, your ideas and your solutions more than ever. The UN was created to solve global problems and there is no bigger global problem than the threat of climate change. And, um, and the good thing about having this issue as part of the um, issues under discussion um, and under deliberation at the UN is that it provides all countries, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how small you are, with a voice to influence the design and outcomes and the global response to climate change. So 
20 countries, the G20 countries, they account for 80% of global emissions and 85% of the global economy. They have the same voice in designing the global response to climate change as Samoa, as Palau, as my own country, Barbados. And therefore, um, it is absolutely crucial that this principle is maintained, where the smallest and most vulnerable countries that are already on the front line of climate change, that they can be part of the solution to this crisis. But we cannot solve climate change only through action by governments. We need all hands on deck. We need businesses, we need civil society, we need young people to be part of the broader coalition, part of the coalition building around finding a solution to climate change. And we've been trained to do, do um, this, We've been doing this. The Secretary General's Climate Action Summit last year was a good example of how broad-based coalitions with a clear vision, with clear goals that are inclusive and diverse and have a roadmap for implementation. These three elements are essential for the type of coalitions that must be assembled to address this crisis. Absolutely. And so these coalitions, how can we all work together to achieve the UN Secretary General's vision and recover better in light of his six climate positive actions? Okay, Sophia, the reality is that we don't, you know, I, I would be lying to you if I were to tell you that we have the luxury of time. We don't, right? Um, science is telling us that we might even cross that dangerous threshold of 1.5 degrees of warming much faster than we um, thought, right? So we have about a decade to have global emissions. That's an enormous feat. However, at this moment, governments are mobilizing trillions of dollars to boost economic growth and to create jobs due to the economic fallout from the COVID crisis. We need your voices, strong, voices to urge governments, to press governments, to ensure that as they design and invest this, these stimulus and recovery trillions of dollars, that they invest in the future, that they invest in clean energy, they invest in building resilience, they invest in ensuring inclusive societies, and they don't invest in polluting um, industries, they don't invest in coal, they don't invest um, um, in fossil fuels, which will jeopardize our ability to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. And the reality is, it is your generation, Sophia. It's young people who will be repaying these trillions of dollars. You should have a voice in the design of these stimulus packages, and you need to urge your governments to ensure that they invest in your future, they invest in you. Absolutely, and I'm so grateful to serve on the youth advisory group so I can really say my point and get my vision across for all youth around the world. Um, and so thank you to all of our speakers. It's been so wonderful hearing about how indigenous people, how UN stakeholders, uh, how influencers, I can really all, and young people, of course, can really all come together to work towards combating the climate crisis. And so now for our final remarks, I would love you all to take one or two minutes to really give us a call to action for our audience. So why in this moment right here and right now is it so crucial for taking urgent and decis uh, decisive action to address the climate crisis? What words would you love to leave our audience with today? And so uh, Selvin, let's start with you. Well, 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 urgency, 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 urgency. We are running out of time very quickly. Um, your future is at stake. The recovery from COVID cannot be a return to business as usual. You, I, I, I really urge all of you um, uh, um, as, a, uh, as someone who knows the dangers of climate change, but also as a father, right? You, you, you know, as a father, I want to ensure that my children have a decent chance, chance of a safe, 
um, environment and a sustainable future. So I really encourage all of you to continue to raise your voice, continue to be advocates. There will be setbacks, but I really encourage you never give up, never give up. We can solve this climate crisis. Thank you so much for your inspirational words. And now, um, Alex, what would you like to share with our audience today? From my experience of working in this field of conservation, I have met uh, certain individuals whose lives have been affected by climate change. And uh, it could be any of us. And it is real. It is happening at a very, very fast rate. And and like I said earlier, nothing can change if it's just one person. Everyone has to act because we're not talking about hundreds of years from now. We are talking in the next 10, 20 years. And it is the biggest uh, problem, the biggest crisis we have in this world today. And we need everyone to understand that everyone can make a difference. It's not just about waiting for someone else to do it. So if you start with yourself and you get people around you to make that difference, then collectively we'll have a big, big difference and a sustainable culture and a sustainable future. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and Joanya, what would you like to share with our audience? Uh, it is a, a very important for us uh, to be together, everybody. Uh, it's important to highlight that indigenous people have a fundamental role in the administration plans, which all speciality, geographic, diversity, and ethnic, ecosystemic reality, and have capacity to assume political representative and position of the authority. So uh, I would like to call everybody to change, to open, to support indigenous peoples in the world, to continue their work, and this way to contribute to, to protect the planets. We need to be a responsibility for our planet. It is urgent time to change human behavior, especially the way how organize internal policies. Um, and this is called to urgence to support indigenous people, especially this moment when I receive a lot of attacks from different authorities, especially in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would love to go back and ask you the question that I was meaning to ask you um, back when I thought we were running out of time. So as the first indigenous woman deputy of Brazil, you're an inspiration. And so could you tell us more about your experience on how multilateral cooperation between different agencies and sectors could work together in defense of our fundamental environmental and human rights? Thank you, Sofia, for asking this. I think it's very nice experience. Be the first indigenous woman to access uh, the position of federal deputy in Brazil makes it possible to legislate on the very important use for indigenous people. I mean, too, for everybody. Allows me uh, to speak up and defend on controversial use such as minor on indigenous land and land tenure regulation uh, makes the opinions of indigenous uh, right and uh, to turn it visi visible for in, in inside the society, society. And addition uh, to give it a space to change and, uh, and elaborate new policies. And uh, so it offers the possibility of dialogue uh, if different sector, uh, be the national indigenous movement, cyber organization, government sector, environmental organization, agro-business sector to parliamentars and different parties and ideology. This is political space, it provides an opportunity to debate and propo proposition. So it is very important for, for us indigenous have this space in national Congress. Uh, but it's challenging, Ch challenging because I am just one, one person. I think you need to support more indigenous to have this space. I understand uh, that there are, could be more cooperation uh, forum in Amazon state. There is a lot of the work done verticality. 
but more work is need horizontality, uh, where agency, public agency, and indigenous representative organization and they partners uh, can share the plans and carry all activity together. This is cries created by the panic shows that were important contribution. So finally, uh, I could coordinate the mixed age parliamentary fronts in the first day indigenous rights in the chamber, and we have promoted many meetings uh, with different sectors and from different states, and just by placing actors in the same space, sharing information, generate synergies. So people in the same place offering, uh, do not take to each other, uh, do not cooperate with each other. So I think the international uh, organization could promote thematic for that action, uh, regionality, promote this moment of dialogue and agreement and also deepening of uh, use. Uh, how do these problems are, uh, could change a present solution? So it is a very historic moment for us in Brazil, especially for women, indigenous women, because show the capacity and could help us and uh, implement our, our rights and defense uh, the rights and to promote uh, debates, but especially in this moment when we have uh, 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 the federal government is totally uh, anti-indigenous, anti-environmental uh, policy and racist. We need to uh, help this moment in National Congress. Thank you for uh, the invitation. I hope this can help me and to create one synergy between different intergeneration. Absolutely. I think that Indigenous people really need to be recognized and be included as parts of conversations the same way that young people really need to be con included. Mm -hmm. And so on that topic, Genevieve, I would actually love to first ask you before your closing remarks, how do you think that um, older people can really help support youth and elevate our voices? How can they really give us a platform? Thank you, Sophia. I think it's really important to continue having intergenerational spaces for young people and elders. And one of the things that we work towards in the Pacific is recognizing that we cannot look to the future without learning from the past. And in the same way, young people can't move forward without learning from our elders. And so we must ensure that there is an intergenerational, um, continued intergenerational work. We can't work without each other. And that's where collaboration comes in. That's where mentoring comes in. And that's where transitions of leadership come in. And young people, indigenous people, women, people with disabilities, all marginalized and vulnerable groups need to be at the table and making the decisions together. Absolutely, I agree. And is there, is there any advice you would give to young people who want to get involved in climate organizing? Yes. Um, I would love to say that your, your voice matters and nobody can tell your story better than you. And in this day and age, we're all living a reality that is beyond anything that we thought. You can get involved and you can make a difference wherever you are. And so reach out um, to organizations, to young people doing amazing things everywhere and get involved. Thank you so much for that. And actually, I'll throw this same question to Alex. I would love to also know uh, what words of encouragement would you give to young people, especially in Thailand, who want to get involved with um, really supporting your agenda and supporting climate action? Well, I really believe in young children. I really believe that it is very important to educate them and let them grow old and really understand nature at a very, very young age so that it, it goes into them and it's part of their lifestyle growing up without having to like have to tell them how important it is later in their lives. So um, I really believe in, in youth empowerment and youth engagement. And I really think that by shaping the young, younger generation is shaping the next generation of leaders because these are the next generation of decision makers that will, will really, really make a difference. So 
to all the young people out there. I believe that they have a voice. I believe that they could come up and be advocates in their own way and, and do whatever they can to fight for what they believe in. And uh, I wish them the best of luck and, and we need them. Like we, we, we're, we're already grown adults. We need them and we need to shape them into becoming the people of society we want them to be. Thank you. I mean, as a young person, I really appreciate that. And I'll just ask that final question um, also to Selwyn, because I know that he plays such a crucial part in making sure that the YAG uh, stays running. So Selwyn, would you give any words of encouragement to young people watching today? Yeah, yes. Um, I just want to join with the um, other colleagues on this call um, in really emphasizing that, um, you know, don't, to young people, don't underestimate the power of your voice. Your voice really, really, really matters. Um, we um, hear your calls for urgency and ambition um, in the United Nations. Um, and we see you on the streets. We see you um, promoting change. So your voice and your actions matter. You know, we are really working hard and the Youth Advisory Group is by no means the end, um, but really just the start. We are working really hard to ensure that you have a seat at the table, that you're just not um, um, some addendum or, 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 or a nice part of segments, but that you have a seat at the table in the design and implementation of policies, the search for solutions, and so, so, so please continue to raise your voice. Uh, we are largely determining your future. The impacts that you will experience, climate impacts, we will not um, um, have impacts as worse as the impacts that you will have and your generation will have if we don't solve this crisis. So continue to be vocal, continue to be active and continue to work together and to reach out, not only within your country, but across national borders as well. Absolutely. Um, and to all young people watching this, you can look at me and Genevieve as an example. We really have, we've carved out spaces in this world and we've actually been able to get our opinion across. And so know that it isn't impossible. There is always an opportunity to really share your perspective and you actually should be sharing your perspective. It shouldn't just be an exception. And you can see with Joanya, there are so many young people um, who really are inspired by conversations like this. And so it's been so wonderful hearing from all of you about how we can all play a part as young people, as UN stakeholders, as influencers, um, as indigenous leaders, how we can all further this conversation, especially in light of COVID, to make sure that we take uh, decisive uh, action uh, to halt this crisis. So thank you to all of our listeners for uh, really helping us to open the dialogue for the session today. It's been so wonderful talking with all of you, and I really hope that this helps give you a little bit of hope and to realize that we really are trying our best to take action on the climate crisis, and together we are stronger. Thank <laughs> you.